going to be one of the most important messages that I have ever brought to Severn Church. If you don't listen to any other message that I preach on Sunday, if you have a tendency to drift off or whatever, stay with me on this one. Because I believe it's important that from time to time that a minister brings a salvation message to the people that are in the church. Because no one knows your heart of whether you have accepted Christ or not, except for you and the Lord. It's important, the Apostle Paul said, went to King Agrippa, and was talking to him about Jesus Christ and about salvation, and how he needed to accept Christ as his Lord and Savior. And King Agrippa said these words, You almost persuaded me, Paul. Almost persuaded me, Paul. A minister in the 1870s took that passage and preached it. What he said was, if you are almost persuaded, then you are entirely lost. If you're almost persuaded to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are entirely lost. If your life were to end today, <coughs> Where would you spend eternity? The decision that you will make today during this service and at the end of the service will determine your outcome for an eternity. If you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, praise the Lord, you're sound and secure in His hands today. If you have not, <coughs> you are almost persuaded. There was a man in the congregation when this minister preached, almost persuaded, that when he got home, he had been writing hymns, and he wrote a beautiful hymn called Almost Persuaded. I look for it in our hymnal, it's not there. I had to go back to an older, older hymnal to, set to, to get the words. I just want to read a few of the words this morning. Almost persuaded now to believe, almost persuaded Christ to receive. Seems now some soul to say, Go, Spirit, go thy way. Some more convenient day, On thee I'll call. Almost persuaded, harvest is past. <coughs> Almost persuaded, doom comes at last. Almost cannot avail. Almost is but to fail. Sad, sad, that bitter wail. Almost, but lost. That's a message in the hymn itself, isn't it? Amen. The Lord never promises us tomorrow. I've had the privilege of preaching probably two to three hundred sermons and uh, funerals in the last seven years. And I will tell you, death is not a respecter of age. Even this week, as I was preparing the sermon, I looked and there was a man in there who was 90 years old who had died. He obviously had lived a full life. The next one now was a man who was 20. And he also died. The Lord never promises us tomorrow. Because there is an appointed time for you to go and for me to go. The Lord has those days numbered. And we don't know, but what we do need to know is we need to be prepared as if it's going to happen soon. Amen. That's why I take my job so seriously as your minister. Because in Ezekiel chapter 3 it says the watchman, the watchman is the one who's supposed to proclaim doom. And if he doesn't, the blood of the people will be upon him. See, a watchman back then would stand on the city walls and his job was to watch. And we saw the enemy coming. He would turn around to the people in the city and say, be prepared because we're getting ready to be attacked. Here's why I take my job as your minister so seriously. Listen to the words in Ezekiel. When the Lord said, when I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not warn them or speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. There are many ministers today that will not preach a salvation message. 
because it may upset some people in the congregation. It may get people to question them whether they're saved or not. But I read this verse to say, if I don't do that, and you die in your sins, then God will hold me accountable. That doesn't mean that I'll lose my salvation. No. But He'll let me know about it one day when I get to glory. So my job today is to make this as crystal clear as possible of whether you have Christ in your heart or not. Or whether you will be saved. Because if you don't, there is impending doom that is coming. I got, had an opportunity to preach a funeral last Sunday afternoon for a dear sweet lady from Providence Baptist Church. In her 80s, lived for the Lord her entire life. Those funerals are easy to preach. Do you hear me? Those funerals are easy to preach. It's those funerals that I stand behind the casket and I don't know. Their family doesn't know if they're saved or not. Those are the ones that are hard. I can't preach them into glory. The Bible says when the time comes, when it's time for you to pass away, your decision making is over. You have staked your claim in your life of whether to accept Christ or not. That's the way it works. We could light candles for you. We could come to the altar and pray for you. But it's not going to bring you into the glory of God. There's only one way. And that's to accept Jesus Christ. As his Lord and Savior. So I want to preach this morning. A sermon titled. Almost Persuaded. Open your Bibles if you will. To Luke chapter 16. Beginning with verse 19. The clear story that Jesus told about heaven and hell. Luke chapter 16, beginning with verse 19. <coughs> I'll wait till you get there because it's important. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in front of you in the hymnal rack, but you need to follow along this morning. Luke 16, beginning with verse 19. Just to let you know before I preach this this morning, that this is not a parable. We learned from last week that a parable was stories that Jesus told that were, that were trying to get a point, get across a heavenly point to the people who were there. This is not a parable. This is Jesus saying, this really happened. Puts a whole different context in the thing, in the thing. He had been speaking in parables up to this point. But this is not a parable. This really happened. Verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At the gate he was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores. And longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table... Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, I don't want you to get the impression that this story is about a rich man and a poor man. It is not. Jesus is telling there was a rich man who lived in luxury every day and there was a poor man. The difference is the rich man did not accept Christ as his Lord and Savior. He lived for himself. He was selfish and wouldn't help the beggar who even came. The beggar was one who had relied on God his entire life. So we see two very distinct people, do we not? We see the rich man who had everything that he needed in life. If he was hungry, he had more than enough food. If he wanted to buy new clothes, he had more than enough to buy the best clothes there were. He put his stock into the things that he made and the things that he had and the things that he accumulated. <coughs> While the beggar who had nothing was brought in front of the rich man's house every day, sat there and waited for crumbs to be thrown out so he would have something to eat. And he was in such distress, it said the dogs would come and lick his sores. That's a pretty bad life, isn't it? Not everything in this life is going to be exactly like you want it or like it. 
You may be in distress the majority of your life. You may be in pain the majority of your life. But one thing you'll know as a Christian, this is temporary. And one day when you get to glory, you won't have that pain anymore. You won't have that struggle anymore. You won't have that sickness or that illness anymore. So we have two very distinct men. Now something happened to them. That one day, if the Lord tarries, what happened to us? And look at verse 22. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. And Abraham's side means heaven. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, I want to stop at these two verses right here. Two very distinct things happened. <coughs> the beggar died, and the Bible says that angels came from glory and escorted him home. You as a believer in Jesus Christ do not need to fear death. That's going to be a wonderful journey from this life to the life of Christ forever and forever. So don't you be fearful about that if you have Christ. If you know that you're saved. But it says the, the, the beggar went to heaven. And I'm telling you that I believe when people get ready to die prior to them dying, that God shows them the angels that will take them home. I've been in the presence of enough people that have seen angels standing around their bed. An older gentleman called me down to his house one day 20 years ago. And he said, I need to tell you something. I went in there and he said, I have angels that visit me every night. He was very close to death. He said, they've even told me what their names are. He said, I can't wait every evening for them to come. They bring me such great comfort. A week later, he passed. I had his story on a little cassette tape. And I had just listened to him tell the story. But he passed. And when he passed, my dear friends, the angels took him home. How glorious is that? We think the Christmas parade up here, the courthouse is something. You ain't seen nothing until the angels come and take you home. They'll take you by the hand and escort you right into glory. And then Jesus will be standing there waiting for you. I can't think of a better journey, can you? Better than a cruise, better than a week in eggs head. It's going to be awesome when that happens. And it says the beggar who had relied on God his whole life was escorted into heaven. <coughs> it says the rich man also died and he was what? Buried. He was buried. You see the difference in the two? When a believer in Jesus Christ dies, there is rejoicing. Even though there's tears, there's rejoicing because why? We know that that person's in glory. But if someone dies without Christ, the person is buried. Of course, we bury the body of believers and non-believers, but there is a difference to me. Because the ones that we bury who have not accepted Christ will die again. They'll die again at the final judgment. When Jesus cast hell and Satan and the demons forever into the burning lake. That is called the second death. We just have to go through it once. If you've accepted Christ, and because you go through it once, it's going to be a joyous thing. So look what happens next. Verse 23. In hell, this is the rich man, where he was in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus by his side. So he called to them, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. <coughs> if you're a non-believer and you die, you're immediately going to hell. <coughs> Can I say that any plan? And hell is a place of great torment, so the rich man looks up and he's able to see heaven for a glimpse. He doesn't plead for a cup of water. He doesn't plead for a gallon of water. He pleads for Lazarus to just dip his finger in water and come to him and just touch the tip of his tongue because he's in torment. What a terrible place to be for an eternity. What a terrible place. 
Look what Abraham says in verse 25. And Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted, and you are in agony. You see the two differences? Now he is comforted, but you are in agony. That's permanent. I'd rather be in comfort, wouldn't you? I would rather much, I'd much rather be in comfort than in agony. And then in verse 26, and beside that, there's a great chasm between us two. So you can't come up here and we can't come down there. Eternal separation forever and ever from God Almighty. Eternal separation <coughs> from your loved ones who are believers and you're maybe not a believer. There's no going in between. There's no middle place that you go to where people can pray you out of and put you to heaven. Immediately, Jesus said, immediately when you die, you're either going to heaven or going to hell. There's no gray area here. And then he says in verse 27, the rich man began, becomes, realizes his fate for an eternity and he becomes an evangelist. And he says, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even as someone rises from the dead. We don't have Moses today, but there are prophets, there are preachers who give out the same type of message on Sunday mornings. The man was so concerned about his family, I have five brothers, please. Somebody warned them about this place. And what did Jesus say? They had the word. They have the prophets and they have the preachers. Let them listen. To them. Let them listen to them. That man's life is over. So what is the beggar now seeing when he's in heaven? We already know he's comforted. What a beautiful place it's going to be. I always think about it took the Lord six days to create the universe that we so enjoy. The stars and the moon and, and the trees and the flowers and the changing of the seasons. In six days, He made that. And Jesus said in John 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I go to prepare a place for you, I will bring you unto Myself. That's been over 2,000 years. Can you imagine the place that Jesus has prepared for you if you're a believer? The mansions in glory. No, 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 no sun or moon in heaven because of the glory of God, just the brightness. You know, you hear people say, I saw a bright light when they're in the midst of passing. I believe as a believer you get to see, begin to see the glory of God. And your families are waiting on you who have passed on. I imagine someone will say, What took you so long? Don't you think? Hands on the hips. I've been waiting for you. What took you so long? Be a joyous reunion forever and forever. That's for the believer. I just want to follow angels around for a little bit. I want to see what makes them fly. I want to hear them singing. I want to hear the music in heaven and the colors in heaven. And most of all, I want to see Christ, our Lord. Because the Bible says that when you die and you arrive in heaven, Jesus is going to give you a crown because you endured the race. You kept your faith to the end. The Bible says that you will take that crown off and bow before Jesus and give it back to Him. What a glorious time that is going to be. That's for you. If you have Christ in your heart. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. With me, please. I've read this before, but I need to read it again. Revelation chapter 20. 
Begin with verse 12. Revelation 20, in verse 12. The Apostle John said, And I saw the dead, great and small. Now even in our story, which one was dead and which one was alive? Then it said the beggar went to heaven, he lived and but the rich man died. Everyone who believe, who does not believe in Christ will stand before God one day. And this is it. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open, and another book was open, which was the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, as death and hell. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and hell were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the, what does it say? Death. The second death. <coughs> if anyone's name was not found or written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Wow. I don't want to experience that. You? No. So why do people put off accepting the Lord today when they hear the message? I've heard them say, well, you know, Pastor, I'm just not right yet. I need to clean my life up before I come to that church. I need to get myself straight. I'm not straight yet. And I say, come to Jesus as you are. Let Him clean you up. Let Him take you and clean you up. Well, Pastor, you know, I'm young. i got a lot of years left in me. i got a lot of wild oats I want to sow before I settle down. The Lord told the man, you fool, tonight your soul will be required of you. You're not here by accident this morning. If you haven't accepted the Lord as your personal Savior, you are not here by accident. The thing that separates you and God in the state that you are in now is called sin. Sin means that you can't stand before a holy God unless Jesus has covered your life with His blood. For all has sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then God demonstrates His own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Isn't that a wonderful gift? You can't earn your way to heaven. It is by grace that you have been saved, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by, work, not by works, so that no one can boast. Then the wages of sin and death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord had to die on that old rugged cross for you and for me to cover those sins. And all He asks is, accept me as Lord and Savior. Accept me as Lord and Savior. And I will cover your sins. I don't care what you did. Jesus said, come. I will cover you with my blood. And you will become righteous before the throne. So how do you become saved? Romans 10 said, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For if you confess with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved, I can't do it for you. You are the ones that have to confess it. Then Jesus said, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And whosoever believes in Him will never perish. That's what I read about, wasn't it? Amen. Will never perish, but have eternal life. If you walk away from here this morning, all you that can hear me, and you do not know if you are saved or not, I have done my job as the watchman. <coughs> I have told you very clearly what's coming, of the impending doom that's coming, if you don't have Christ in your heart. 
I'm going to do something a little different today. I'm going to ask you just to sit where you are and bow your head. I've asked Shirley to play and sing that song, Almost Persuaded. If you need Christ this morning, listen to me. Get up from where you are sitting and come down here and take me by the hand. And I will pray with you and I will lead you to Christ today. I want everyone's head bowed. Don't worry about what other people will think. I want you to close your eyes. 